Hello everyone, and welcome to this introductory course on quantum computing. In this course, I'll be introducing the basics of quantum computing, uh, how it works, and how it can be applied. In this first lecture, we'll be covering what is quantum computing. Before we get into that, uh, let's take a look at a quick look at the course overview. So in this course, aside from this first lecture about what quantum computing is, we'll also be covering qubits, which is the basic unit of information for quantum computers, superposition, one of the three quantum mechanical phenomena that quantum computers take advantage of, uh, quantum gates, which quantum computers used to execute algorithms, entanglement and interference, which are the other two quantum mechanical phenomena that help quantum computers gain an advantage over classical computers. Uh, then we'll be covering quantum circuits, which are which create the algorithms that quantum computers can run, which give us an advantage over classical computers. Then we'll be looking at the quantum stack, which is the layers of hardware in quantum computing that allow quantum computers to operate. Uh, ninth, we'll be covering the applications of quantum computing. And finally, we'll talk about the quantum landscape and also where quantum computing is headed uh, in the next decade. So let's jump right in. First, we'll, be, we'll take a look at what the difference is between quantum computers and classical computers. So classical, classical computers have bits, which take a value of either zero or one. Uh, these are your transistors in your computers and they are also just the basic unit of information that all computers use in order to operate. Uh, the zero and one are sort of like the light switches in your house that can be turned on and off. Quantum systems, on the other hand, have qubits, which, are, which is an abbreviation for quantum bits, and these can either have a value of zero or one, but they also have a third state they can be in, which is called superposition. And this is sort of like a value between zero and one, and it helps quantum computers take advantage over classical computers. So what is the significance of qubits as opposed to bits? Uh, the significance of qubits is that with qubits, the power of quantum computers increases exponentially while the power of classical computers increases linearly because they use bits. So because of qubits and the fact that we can put them in superposition, this is a concept we'll explore in the superposition and qubits lectures, but just as a basic understanding, because we can put qubits in superposition, we can gain a superposition of all of our possible results. And this allows uh, quantum computers to increase exponentially with each qubit. So we can see here in quantum computers, for every nth qubit added, the quantum computer has two to the n power. But in classical computers, for every n transistor added or bit added, the classical computer has 2n power. So what exactly makes quantum computing faster? We already talked a little bit about superposition with qubits, but there are also two other quantum mechanical phenomena that allow quantum computers to be faster than classical computers. And these are entanglement and interference. Uh, we'll have separate lectures covering each of them, but just know for right now that it's basically these three phenomena that help quantum computers be faster than classical computers. Now, let's take a look at some of quantum computing's projected applications. Uh, first, we have cybersecurity. Uh, there's an algorithm called Shor's algorithm, which threatens to break RSA encryption, which is a widely used encryption technique. So uh, quantum computers definitely have the capability of revolutionizing our cybersecurity industry. Second, we have machine learning. Uh, quantum computers, because they're exponentially faster than classical computers, uh, they allow machine learning to experience massive improvements. Third, we have drug development. Uh, because quantum computers are sort of operated using some of nature's laws, we like the three quantum mechanical phenomena of superposition, entanglement, and interference, they also happen to be very good at simulating nature, and this will help uh, companies or just users of quantum computers to develop new drugs, for example, like cures to different diseases or 
uh, creating more efficient chemicals in a solution. Then we have logistics uh, and just optimization in general. So quantum computers happen to be very good at optimizing a lot of different things as well. So we can use this to optimize our supply chain, which is the logistics application, but op just optimization in general, uh, quantum computing is quite good at. And finally, we have finance. This is sort of like an extension of optimization as well, but uh, quantum computers can uh, optimize like auto trading in the stock market and different things like that. So quantum computing definitely has its applications in finance as well. But it's just worth mentioning that uh, there are also more applications. These are just some of the examples of projected applications. Quantum computing has a lot of potential and there's many different applications that may have not just not been discovered yet. It is important to note, however, that quantum computers solve only certain problems faster than classical computers. Because of this, uh, quantum computers most likely won't completely replace classical computers. Classical computers will be better, will most likely be better at performing your everyday tasks, and most likely your cell phones and your computers will remain the same. However, quantum computers are extremely good at solving extremely complex problems. And because of this, they'll mostly be used in large companies or for very extensive research in order to solve problems a lot faster. And one of this, one of the reasons for this is because of the hardware used in quantum computers. So let's talk a bit about the quantum hardware versus the classical hardware. In the hardware of quantum computing, the qubits or the quantum bits are super sensitive to the environment. Because of this, they have to be kept extremely cold so that their quantum states can't be decayed. Uh, I know that we use dilution refrigerators to cool quantum computers down to around one millikelvin so that they can operate with lower error rates. And this is another problem with quantum hardware. A lot of them currently have high error rates. And because of this, they can easily mess up the quantum algorithms that are being run on the quantum computer. And finally, the quantum states, as mentioned before, they collapse easily when they are affected by the environment. I think quantum states can only last a couple of milliseconds, so there's only a limited amount of computing that you can do currently on quantum computers. As for classical computers, uh, obviously we know that they can operate at room temperatures, they have very low, and they have very low error rates. Because of this, they will most likely be better for everyday use, and quantum computers won't completely replace classical systems. Currently, quantum computing is still being developed. Therefore, no one really knows which material will create the best qubit to build the best quantum computers. However, some of the most prominent qubits that are currently being researched are superconducting qubits, and trapped qubits, photonic qubits, topological qubits, and diamond and V-center qubits. All of these different qubits have their own merits to them, so where superconducting might be uh, very good at one aspect, they might be lacking in another aspect that maybe the ion trap qubit is very good at. So because of this, all these different types of qubits are being investigated to see which one will be perfect for the perfect quantum computer. So that's it for today. Uh, next lecture, we'll be talking about the qubit and how it, what its role is in the quantum computer and how we sort of manipulate them. Thanks guys and have a nice day.